the Singapore World War II Museums and Displays, Fort Siloso, the Fortress of Singapore. Fort Siloso, symbol of Singapore's past. For many years, Sentosa Island was known as Blackang Mati. Located at the entrance to Keppel Harbor, the island was recognized for its strategic importance long before the 1880s, but little was done before the opening of the Suez Canal. Then the British realized that they needed to protect Singapore's trade-bursting harbor and cold stocks from invaders by sea. Several forts and batteries were built on Black Ang Mati, including this one, Fort Siloso, where you are standing now. Fort Siloso is the only preserved coastal fortification in Singapore. It is also the oldest military structure on Sentosa Island. Here at Fort Siloso, you can learn how Britain defended her coastal colonies. You can also see what life was like for soldiers who lived at Fort Siloso and elsewhere in Blackang Mati. You can also learn about the role that Fort Siloso played during World War II. Along the way, you will learn more about World War II, the Japanese occupation of Singapore, and the two dramatic surrenders that occurred here. You will learn what it was like for military and civilian prisoners of war who stayed at Fort Siloso, some of whom were later sent to construct the Thai Burma Death Railway. Fort Siloso became a historical site when the Singapore government decided to develop Sentosa Island for recreation. The fort was restored and officially opened to the public in 1975. Here is an 1891 to 1924 map of Keppel Harbor. What does Black Kang Mati mean? How did the island get its name? Pulau Black Kang Mati is a Malay term that means island of those who die behind. In the 1830s and 1840s, a Bugis community was known to be living on the island. In the late 1840s, a malaria outbreak almost wiped out the settlers. Survivors moved to Singapore, and it is believed that this event gave Black Kang Mati its name. The World War II Experience Museum relives Singapore's World War II history. Here are two young boys dressed as gunners at the end of the 19th century, at the entrance to the World War II Experience Museum building. Here's a searchlight being prepared. As we go through the door, the first display is about the false narrative about the guns of the fortress facing the wrong way. A famous myth about Fort Siloso is that its guns were never fired during the battle for Singapore in 1942 because they were facing the wrong way. In fact, the guns were designed to fire at naval targets. When Japanese troops invaded Singapore, the guns were rotated and fired landward. Here is the same thing in Japanese and Chinese. Here are a couple of gunners before World War II. Here is a joke postcard from Blackang Mati with a humorous misspelling of teacher. Blackang Mati was the name for the fortress until the end of the British garrison periods, following the war up until 1956, when the area was turned over to the Singapore government to eventually become part of Sentosa Park. What kind of action did Fort Siloso see during the two world wars. The defenses of Singapore were not tested during the First World War, but gunners stationed at Black Kang Mati helped round up mutineers from a unit of the Indian Army. During World War II, 
Fort Siloso and the other forts of Blackang Mati endured heavy bombing by Japanese aircraft because of their ability to provide substantial fire support for British troops. The 9.2-inch guns of Fort Kanat fired on the advancing Japanese near Tenga Airdrome. The 6-inch guns of Fort Siloso fired on Japanese forces in the West Coast Road area and sank a Japanese troop ship nearing the harbor. Fort Siloso's guns also assisted in the destruction of oil installations so they would not fall into Japanese hands. The fortress had a tangled chain of command with orders coming from seven different commanders. The Singapore defenses had 88,600 troops and 158 aircraft. General Percival's forces were a mixed one. They included, for example, units of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, who were incidentally the only British troops in Malaya that were actually trained for jungle warfare. Regiments of the British Indian Army, a division of Australian troops, and here are two soldiers from the Malay Regiment. Air Vice Marshal Pulford had only 158 frontline aircraft available, all of them obsolete. This photograph shows a squadron of Brewster Buffaloes, which was no match for the Japanese Zero fighters. Plus the volunteers. Although the official policy was not to arm large numbers of the local population, as emphasis on was on production of vitally needed exports, a number of poorly trained and under-equipped local volunteer units were formed. Many European officers were not spared from part-time soldiering. And the naval base was empty. The same information on another board. The commercial life of Singapore was largely in the hands of European companies. Examples of this were the Great Eastern Life Assurance Company, the KPM office, Call Your K, the Mercantile Bank, and Singapore Cold Storage. During the 1920s, many local businessmen laid the foundations of what were to become large trading companies. The world slump, however, at the beginning of the 1930s was a blow to the economy of Singapore as rubber prices fell. This taught local businessmen not to rely on European capital, but rather to diversify into banking and finance themselves. Generous donations were received from the local community for the China Relief Fund and to help Britain's war effort. The Chinese community was also active in business and many men were highly successful like Li Kongqian who founded the Li Rubber Company and Ha Boon Ha, the Tiger Bong King. Indians contributed to the business life of the city. Many worked as teachers, civil servants, and in the professions. These were people like Dr. N. Virasani, JP, and Mr. M. A. Namazi. Malays were active in occupations such as the civil service, transportation, and fishing. Here is a Malay civil servant and a group of Malay leaders. Business as usual. Malayan raw materials such as rubber and tin were vital to the British war effort. They were exported to America to earn dollars to pay for armaments. The colony became known as the dollar arsenal. Here are a few boards that say much of the same thing. 
However, events happening in Europe and Asia would soon change Singapore forever. Meanwhile, at dawn on 1st September 1939, German troops invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. A small force of regular troops was sent to France and the British Navy slipped out into the grey wastes of the North Sea. With Japan busy in China, the defense of Malaya and Singapore assumed a very low priority. But Malayan raw materials such as oil, tungsten, rubber and tin were vital to the British war efforts. They were exported to America to pay for armaments and the colony became known as the Dollar Arsenal. Here is the same information in Japanese and Chinese. So what brought Japan into conflict with Singapore and the Western powers? 1894 was the first step. A revolt in Korea gave Japan its excuse to invade with an army equipped with rifles and modern artillery. In 1904 and 1905, Japan defeated Russia. A major Russian fleet was crippled by Japanese warships at the Battle of Tsushima, and Port Arthur was captured. For the first time, an Asian power had defeated a Western one. The rise of Japan as a world power. Japan's essential problem, a large population compressed onto a few islands with few raw materials to support an industrial economy. From 1931 to 1937, since 1904, Japan had an interest in the South Manchurian Railway. On 18 September 1931, the Japanese army occupi occupied Mukden, the start of a process that was to lead to outright war with China. 1921, the Washington Naval Treaty. After the horror of the First World War, there was international pressure to limit armaments. At a conference in Washington, the great powers agreed to limit battleship construction on a ratio basis. Japan felt cheated. September 1939, the world at war. At dawn on 1st September 1939, German troops invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. A small force of regular troops was sent to France and the British Navy slipped out into the grey wastes of the North Sea. With Japan still busy in China, the defense of Malaya and Singapore assumed a very low priority. Japan under pressure. When war broke out in Europe, Japan was initially neutral, but decided to sign the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy in September 1940. Japan needed supplies and raw materials. The collapse of France and Holland had laid their colonies in the Far East open to a Japanese takeover. In August 1940, Japan moved into bases in French Indochina. The government was led by Prince Kornoye, a moderate. His cabinet decided to embark on a program designed to gain control of Indochina, Malaya, Singapore, Thailand and the Dutch East Indies by peaceful means if possible. America reacted by applying economic pressure. To counter Japanese activities in China, America reacted by banning the export of strategic raw materials. Finally, in June 1941, all Japanese assets in America were seized. Negotiations failed. On 16th October 1941, Prince Kornoye resigned to be replaced by the militarist General Hideki Tojo as Japan rushed headlong down the road to war. The Japanese were left with two options, fight or surrender. Singapore, 
a booming trade center, an important port, a vital part of the British Empire. In Singapore, the Chinese raised funds to support the war against Japan. In the 1930s, Singapore became a fortress. During the 1920s and 1930s, a modern naval base was built on the north shore of Singapore Island. To defend the naval base, large numbers of heavy guns were emplaced to deter an attack from the sea by hostile forces. In spite of warnings by a number of staff officers, the official planners refused to accept that an army could attack from the north through the jungles of Malaya. Defense. Large area. Inadequate forces. Air Vice Marshal Pulford had only 158 frontline aircraft available. The Brewster Buffaloes were no match for the Japanese Zero fighters. The problem for the Army how to defend airfields scattered all over Malaya with only a small number of troops. General Percival's force was a mixed one, 88,600 troops. Geography and Climate Malaya was largely covered by jungle and only one road and one railway ran from north to south. Force Z or Force Z, if you are of British ancestry. The British government's answer to the increasing threat posed by Japan was to send a task force of two battleships. The aircraft carrier, which should have accompanied them, struck a reef in the West Indies and never arrived. The arrival of Force Z gave great confidence to the people of Singapore. However, on 10th December 1941, Force Z was sunk by Japanese torpedo bombers while on its way to attack Japanese transports in the Gulf of Siam. Here is the same information again. The arrival of the fleet gave great confidence to the local people of Singapore and was enthusiastically reported in the press. Here's the same thing again with further information. Force Z arrives. The British Navy ignored the striking power of modern aircraft. Admiral Tom Phillips, commander of Force Z, said, Modern warships can operate without air cover. Furthermore, the British attitude to the Japanese armed forces was one of contempt. This is from an intelligence officer lecturing to Australian troops on their way to Singapore. The Japanese are very small and short-sighted and thus totally unsuited physically to tropical warfare. They have aeroplanes made from old kettles and kitchen utensils, guns salvaged from the war against Russia, and rifles of the kind used in films about the Red Indians. Winston Churchill said, The political situation in the Far East does not seem to require the maintenance of large forces in the Far East at this time. And later from Churchill, I ought to have known the possibility of Singapore having no landward defenses no more entered my mind than that of a battleship being launched without a bottom. And there's the same thing in Japanese. 
The Battle of Singapore. The fortress that wasn't. Here is Japanese artillery in Johor hitting aerodromes. These were Penga, Sambalwana, and Selatar aerodromes. Meanwhile, civilians were vulnerable to air attacks on Singapore, as well as further attacks on Kaliang Aerodrome. The last reinforcements arrived. During the latter part of January, the British 18th Division arrived in Singapore. While the soldiers were locked in battle with the Japanese invaders, the civilians had their own war to fight. On 11 February 1942, the last fighter aircraft left Singapore, their aerodromes having been destroyed by Japanese gunfire. Here is the same information in Japanese and Chinese with the title of Gal Force being used for the Singapore Defending Forces. On the nights of 8th and 9th February 1942, three Japanese divisions crossed the Straits of Johor and established footholds on the northern shore of Fortress Singapore. By 12th February, the defensive perimeter had radically shrunk and the Japanese controlled three quarters of the island. The battle for the vital reservoirs and Ukitima was lost. For the rest, it was surrender. As the victorious Japanese advanced into the suburbs, it was obvious to Governor Sir Shenton Thomas and General Percival that the fortress could hold out no longer. On the morning of 15 February 1942, a British delegation bearing a white flag met the Japanese at Phuket Tima and arranged a ceasefire. 1942, the fall of Singapore. For the POWs. Letters from home were one of the few joys that prisoners were allowed. Cholera and malaria ran rampant through the camps. The struggle to survive, the meager rations, and for many being transported away to become slave labor on the railway of death, connecting Japanese occupied areas from Thailand to Burma. Next is a small art exhibition with the writings and drawings of a few of the POWs. Behind the Barbed Wire by Carol van der Steren. Carol van der Steren was a Dutch prisoner of war, POW, during the Japanese occupation of the Far East, 1942 to 1945. The cartoons on display are from his book about POW life under the Japanese entitled Behind the Barbed Wires. According to Carol, after more than 40 years I decided to collect my cartoons to preserve them because humor is immortal. He supported us and kept us alive during the internment years. These cartoons are dedicated to all the POWs in the Far East. The Story of a Railway by Tom Engels the illustrations of the Thai Burma Railway are the works of Tom Engels, a Dutch ex-POW. These sketches form part of a collection of 15 sketches in Tom's story of a railway package. During the war, Tom was part of a sapper unit responsible for carrying out demolition attacks against Japanese forces. When the Dutch East Indies Army capitulated on 8th March 1942, Tom and many other POWs were sent to Thailand to work on the railway. These sketches serve as memoirs of his life as a POW constructing the Thai Burma Railway. Stanley Warren Stanley Warren is best known as the painter of the Changi murals in St. Luke's Chapel. They were painted while he was an internee at Changi during the Japanese occupation of Singapore, 1942 to 1945. These works on display were done during his internment years. They included a wide range of subjects, from portraits of his fellow internees 
to local life. However, it is his Changi murals which draw the most attention. These murals embodied the faith that sustained many prisoners of war, POWs, at Changi during the occupation years. Stanley Warren passed away on 20th February 1992 at Bridport in Bridport, England. W. R. M. Haxworth Mr. W. R. M. Puggy Haxworth, a Singapore police member, was one of the many civilians interned at Changi. During his internment, he worked as a gardener. When he was not gardening or being otherwise engaged, he built up a collection of sketches and watercolors of individuals and scenes of Changi prison. His works provided a very vivid account of life in the prison camp. On display are only a few of the 400 or so sketches done by Mr. Haxworth. After his death in 1985, his sketches were donated to the National Archives of Singapore on Hill Street, where they can be viewed. Indian POWs were persuaded to join the Indian National Army, founded by Subhash Chandra Bosch, to liberate India from British rule. Here are captured Indian soldiers being persuaded to join the INA. Here is Subhash Chandra Bosch. Here is the Rani of Jansi Regiment, the all-woman fighting unit. Here is Subhash Chandra Bosch inspecting the Rani of Jansi Regiment, led by Dr. S. Lakhmi. And a military parade held by General Mohan Singh on the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi. Approximately 30,000 to 40,000 Indian POWs changed sides and fought for the Japanese Empire, ironically to serve a far more oppressive empire. Many of these men became POW camp guards, actual combat troops, and administrative personnel, but many thousands returned to India as insurgents and burned large areas of rice crops another means of supplying and feeding northern India and Bengal. As the British were forced out of Myanmar, cutting off the rice supplies from that direction, Bengal and northern India fell into a famine that lasted for the rest of the war. After the war, the nationalists joined with Gandhi and continued their efforts, disregarding or forgetting that the Japanese Empire was the reason why they were fighting in the first place. Churchill had been recently blamed for this famine, although he had absolutely nothing to do with it, and British, Indian, and Allied forces also suffered from the actions of Bosch's INA. Much of the time, Indian forces in the British Army were involved in efforts to shut down these insurgents. These are images of the Indian National Army trials for treason during and after the war. The remaining traitors joined with Gandhi, gaining respectability to form the Quit India movement. Some of the prisoners of war remained in Singapore to construct a new airfield at Changi, while others were shipped north to work on the Death Railway between Burma and Siam. Here are Sikh guards and British prisoners of war at work. Here is a map of the Death Railway. European civilians were ordered to assemble at the Padang and were marched off to captivity in Changi prison. Here are British prisoners of war at work under Japanese guard. Here again are Sikh guards and British prisoners of war at work. Here are Australian prisoners of war in Changi prison. Here are Asians watching Australian prisoners of war sweeping the streets. 
Here are prisoners of war shortly after the surrender, still wearing their helmets. British prisoners of war were mainly concentrated in the Changi area at Selerang Barracks. Here is another picture of prisoners of war. Here are Japanese troops escorting a British prisoner of war. Here are British prisoners of war at Selerang Barracks. Overcrowding, poor sanitation, and food soon took their toll. Here are shelters rigged in Selerang Barracks. Men who were undernourished at the start of their captivity were soon starved and emaciated. Here, another British soldier surrenders. More of the same in Japanese. Writings from the prisoners of war. We were stunned and surprised at the news of the surrender. It took some time for it to sink in. We all felt let down. Joseph Cussell, Gunner, 11th Battery, 7th Coast Regiment, Royal Artillery, February 15th. 1942. With mounting civilian casualties and a shortage of food and water, Lieutenant General A. E. Percival, General Officer Commanding Malaya, was faced with two alternatives to mount a counteroffensive or capitulation. He chose the latter. When news of the impending British surrender reached Blackang Mati, complete demolition of the island's guns were carried out. On 14 February 1942, the 6-inch BL guns at Fort Siloso were destroyed and the 12-pounder QF gun, together with other valuable stores, were thrown over the cliff. Complete demolition of the remaining guns on the island was carried out the next day. On 15 February 1942, six days after the Japanese landing in Singapore, Lieutenant General Percival surrendered to Lieutenant General Yamashita at the Ford factory at Bukit Timah. About 100,000 British, Australian, Indian, and Malay troops became prisoners of war, POW, under 60,000 Japanese troops. Blackang Mati, including Fort Siloso, became a POW camp for both military and civilian personnel. 15 February 1942 marked the beginning of three and a half tumultuous years of Japanese occupation in Singapore. 1945, the end of the Japanese Empire. Here is the statement of the effects of the atomic bombs on Japan, leading to surrender in Japanese. Here is the same gunner again. People were cheering and waving at us. Everybody seemed to be very happy. It was a lot different to the day we walked to Changi in 1942. Joseph Cussell, Gunner, 11th Battery, 7th Coast Regiment, Royal Artillery, 18th August, 1945. By May 1945, the war in Europe was coming to an end but it continued unabated in the Far East. Plans for an Allied amphibious landing in Malaya still went ahead. Codenamed Operation Zipper, it was to take place in September 1945. However, the war came to a swift end when Japan surrendered unconditionally on 15th August 1945, following the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on 6th and 9th August 1945. On 2nd September 1945, the historic surrender ceremony took place on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Mamoru Shigemitsu, Japan's foreign minister, and American General Douglas MacArthur, representing the Allied Nations, signed the surrender documents. Also present at the ceremony was Lieutenant General Percival who had surrendered Singapore in February 1942. Three days later, British troops repossessed Singapore. On 12th September 1945, 
the Japanese surrender in Southeast Asia became official. The Japanese legation, led by General Itagaki Seishiro, formally surrendered to Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, Supreme Allied Commander in Southeast Asia, in Singapore's City Hall. After the war, the attitude of the local people of Singapore towards their colonial rulers changed. The defeat of the British in 1942 and the Japanese occupation which followed lit the spark of nationalism that marked the beginning of the end of colonial rule in Singapore. And now we leave that museum to the next location. Here is the Watchtower and Soldiers Recreation Area during the 1930s. Here we are looking at the big guns of Fortress Singapore. A closer look showing the damage to the threads in the breaches that made the weapons useless to the Japanese. The Tunnel B complex displays. The 6 inch gun battery display. 1930 the ammunition hoist. Ammunition was raised from magazine level to the gun emplacement above by means of the replicated hoist which is seen here. This was used to raise both shells and cartridges and greater numbers than the earlier type of hoists. Here's the upper end of the hoist. along the Heritage Trail. Here is the engine room display of the 1880s. This was an engine room that provided power for the submarine mining post, which controlled electrically operated mines, strung out underwater across the western entrance to the harbor. It also powered the searchlights overlooking the harbor. In the 19th century, power generator power generators were coal-fired. This engine room was soon replaced by a new and larger underground engine room near the submarine mining post. The new underground engine room was in operation sometime before 1896. The Special Operations Force 136 from 1942 to 1945. The building that the next group of displays are located in. Sitting in front of the building is this. Here is the wreckage of a Japanese aircraft engine. This wreckage belongs to a Japanese Army Type 99 assaulter plane shot down over Singapore by British anti-aircraft fire on 14 February 1942, a day before the British surrender. The two-man plane formed part of the Japanese 27th Squadron. The wreckage was found accidentally 46 years later at Toi Payo, central part of Singapore, on 27 February 1988 by construction workers who were digging at the site. The original purpose of the building, the store. 1930s, store. This building was constructed during the upgrade of Fort Siloso in the 1930s. Its use in the early years was unknown, but it was labeled as a store on a 1950s dated plan of the fort. And now we enter the building. Japanese Conquest. Lee Kuan Yew, Prime Minister of Singapore, 1959 to 1990, said, The war opened the eyes of many people in Singapore. 
things would never be the same again. My colleagues and I are of that generation of young men who went through the Second World War and the Japanese occupation and became determined that no one, neither the Japanese nor the British, had the right to push and kick us around. We were determined that we could govern ourselves and bring up our children in a country where we can be a self-respecting people. Same thing in Japanese. The next display board, the Shonen years. Life during the Japanese occupation, 1942 to 1945. This included loss of innocent life, suffering, hatred, brutal torture, destruction, fear to control the people, food shortages, hardship, betrayals, Nippongo, which is forced study, studying of the Japanese language and use in public and official buildings during the Japanese regime. Nippongo. All Singapore rushed to Japanese classes, which sprang up in every quarter of the city. To acquire a smattering of Nippongo would make life easier when one confronted sentries. The Japanese were better disposed to those who spoke their language. Some Singaporeans went beyond acquiring a smattering of Nippongo. Certificates of proficiency and badges were issued with regular and frequent tests. Here is a Japanese language certificate. Here are two national textbooks. Propaganda Tencho Setsu Emperor's birthday was celebrated on 29th April 1942. Children paraded on the Padang and sang Ai Koku Koshin Kyoik, the patriotic song. There were rallies and speeches. At the cinemas, special propaganda movies were screened. All households were told to fly the Japanese flag. A booklet of patriotic songs was published to help local people learn the songs. Song sheets were distributed freely. Japanese propaganda called for an Asia for the Asiatics. All English signboards were replaced by Japanese. Education. Education came under the Bureau of Public Welfare in the Tokubetsu Sea. Mamoru, Mamoru Shinozaki was chief executive of the education department and he reopened the primary schools in April 1942. Children were educated in the Nippon way and Nippongo became the official common language of Malaya and Singapore. The Japanese style of physical training was a regular drill in unison with music of Radio Taisho. Children were taught to sing Japanese songs and be little Nipponjins. Culture As an illustration of Japanese interest in promoting cultural activities besides those related to the propagation of Nippongo, there was a Music for Everyone drive. Regular performances were given by the so-called Shonan Orchestra, whose programs included Japanese and Western music. It was conducted by D. Applebaum. People were encouraged, encouraged to see Japanese films. <coughs> Shonen Tokubetsu Shi. A municipal government, Tokubetsu Shi, was formed in March 1942 with Shigeo Odate as mayor. It had four major bureaus, General Affairs, Public Welfare, which included the Educational Department, Public Works, and Police. The municipality set out immediately to restore normal conditions in everyday life. A few days after capitulation, prices were officially pegged and refugees from upcountry were ordered to return home. In practice, the Tokubetsu Shi was subordinate to the military administration, the Gunsaikan Bu. The Gunsaikan Bu 
published a comprehensive handbook of tariffs, regula regulations, taxation, registration, etc. in June 1943. Sukqing, literally meaning the purge of undesirable elements. The Sukqing took place soon after the fall of Singapore. On 17 February, all Chinese males between the ages of 18 and 50 were ordered to concentrate in five designated camps for screening. Here is a copy of the declaration posted with explanation by the museum in Japanese and Chinese. Those who passed the screening were issued with a paper with the word examined in Chinese or had square ink marks stamped on their shirts or arms, which they tried to preserve for months. The unfortunate ones were stamped with triangular marks and driven off to a tragic fate. The operation, codenamed Operation Cleanup, was planned by Colonel Tsuji and endorsed by General Yamashita. It was aimed at ridding Shonan of pro-British and anti-Japanese elements, such as members of the Dal Force, Singapore Volunteer Corps, and those who contributed funds and support for the nationalist Chinese war against Japan. Here is Colonel Tsuji. Here is a Kempitai, secret police, equivalent to the Nazi Gestapo, the Communist Chinese Red Guard Security Forces, or the Soviet Union. NKVD. Here is the YMCA building in Singapore, which was used as Kempitai headquarters. No official records are available as to how many perished during Operation Cleanup. The Kempitai reported 6,000 Chinese executed, but the number could have been as high as 20,000. The Suk Ching destroyed Japanese hopes of gaining the cooperation of the Singaporeans. Here is the same thing in Japanese and Chinese. In March 1942, an overseas Chinese association was formed and with it the release of prominent Chinese leaders was secured. A demand was made by Japanese authorities of a $50 million donation from the Chinese in Malaya and Singapore. Singapore had to pay $10 million of the $50 million demanded. The Japanese followed different policies towards different communities. They treated the Chinese harshly while attempting to enlist the support of Malays and Indians. Here are the first anniversary celebrations of the fall of Singapore. Here are Japanese tanks rolling into Singapore. Here is the previous statement in Japanese and Chinese. Here is a photo of the Japanese Emperor's birthday celebrations. Here is the General Post Office turned into military headquarters. It is now the Fullerton Hotel. Here are Indian workers clearing away rubble. Here are Japanese Shonan troops. Here is more of the anniversary celebrations. Health. Dr. Kozo Ando became Shonan's chief medical officer and he issued an order for all GPs to get armbands and report to Chuo Byoing, Kandang Kerbao Hospital. Private clinics and dispensaries were reopened on 1st March 1942 and an ordinance was issued to people to keep their house clean, rid of mosquitoes and to attend immunization against smallpox and cholera. On April 6, 1942, compulsory vaccination was introduced. However, by the end of 1943, the sanitary condition of Shonan deteriorated. Pipe water was contaminated, as the filtering system had not been cleaned since the fall of Singapore. Hospitals were bare of equipment, and drugs were also put on the black market. Other essential services were breaking down. Here is an armband and other medical services articles and documents. Tokyo Time 
Singapore was renamed Xionan, also Xionan Tou, Light of the South, and designated the capital of Japan's southern region. Local time was changed to Tokyo time, two hours advanced. All official appointments were made and kept according to this time, and the hours of business were also fixed accordingly. The year 1942 was recorded as 2602, following the Japanese calendar. Food rationing. As supplies of the commodities were getting scarce, rice cards were issued to every family. These cards authorized a ration of 8 catties, 4.8 kilograms, of rice per person per month, half for children. Beside textiles and cooking oil from the distribution union. The rice ration was cut to 6 catties, 3.6 kilograms, in early 1944. Here is a collection of ration cards. Kumiai. The Japanese set up Kumiai or guild associations to control the issue of essential materials which were in short supply so as to ensure that the army's needs were obtained first. In practice, the Kumiai system became a government-backed black market in the control of a handful of Japanese businessmen and operated by local entrepreneurs. As seen, as soon as a kumiai for any particular commodity was formed, the commodity soon disappeared from the markets and became difficult to get. As a result, prices soared. Here is a rice purchaser's registration card. Currency. The influx of Japanese military script to replace British Straits currency put the country in the grip of chronic inflation. While the Japanese military offensive continued, the currency was sound. But once the fortunes of war turned against Japan, the value of the paper money began to slide. Commonly known as bananas or coconuts, because they bore the designs of these plants, the first notes were numbered, but subsequent notes were not, and the quality was so poor that notes were easy to forge. Savings Campaign To combat inflation and to divert funds to their war effort, the Japanese tried to mop up spare money in, straight lo in state lotteries, gambling farms, and savings campaigns. Gambling and lotteries were popular. But the savings campaigns, first started in February 1944, managed to amass more than $281 million. Shonen was in the middle of its fourth savings campaign when the war ended. Communication Stamps New postage stamps announcing the rebirth of Malaya or the inauguration of the Asian co-prosperity sphere were daily reminders that Malaya and Singapore were under a new regime. Early in January 1943, there were threats that in the near future, Nipongo would be the only language permitted in postal correspondence, while after 1st April, only numbers called in Nipongo would receive the attention of the telephone exchange. There were even talks of a Singapore-Tokyo Railway. However, these were not carried out. Kempitai Kempitai was a military police force, specially trained in interrogation methods. Its task was to crush all resistance to military rule. It had powers to arrest and extract information from civilians and military alike and thus was feared and dreaded by all. The Kempitai would employ secret agents and informers to denounce those suspected of disloyalty. Thus, citizens destroyed all evidence of connection with the colonial regime. English books, Boy Scout uniforms, Western gramophone records, etc. Unscrupulous informers would blackmail anyone especially the affluent professionals, as a word from these informers meant 
Instant arrest and imprisonment without trial. Torture and starvation were also tools of the dreaded Kempitai, and the whole period of the occupation was a time of rumor, fear, and secrecy, when it was unsafe to voice any opinion at all. Here is a copy of the statement of Mr. Yap Fong Gook's statement on his nephew being taken away by the Kempitai. Again, here's a picture of the Kempitai headquarters at the YMCA. Blue Cross The Blue Cross, with its emblem of a blue Maltese cross set within a red circle and a white background, was set up to relieve distress and meet the people's needs. It began with the removal of dead bodies from the streets. The Blue Cross also set up free feeding centers and Chinese sinseis provided medical treatment. In the closing stages of the occupation, the Blue Cross went into firefighting and immediate relief of fire victims when the Allies bombed Shona. Here is a Blue Cross armband and badge. Sedan. The Sedang system was similar to a headman system of rule and control. The population was divided into groups of households. A one-star sedan was appointed to take charge of 30 households, which in turn came under a two-star sedan who was responsible for a district. A three-star sedan was in charge of a divisional area. All families were registered and households given peace living certificates. The system kept a tight rein on the people's movements as all changes of address, traveling, rationing, etc. were put in the control of the Sedang, who in turn had to report to the Japanese at the police stations. The Sedang in Chinese means auxiliary police. Here is a Sedang armband and badge with a few Sedang members in a photo. Here are some peace living certificates. Population Census Registration of families began on 19th April 1942. Identification certificates were issued to families which registered. Here are some registration lists and issued identification certificates. Employment The Japanese intended to keep everybody busy. They called for a self-sufficient shonan, but in practice, industry, communications, commerce, and finance were harnessed to the war machine. From December 1944, the military administration forbade men of military age to work as waiters, office peons, salesmen, cooks, tailors, hawkers, or in similar occupations in which women had to take their place men were drafted into the Military Labor Corps of Defense. On 1st January 1944, registration of all workers on the island was announced. All workers had to register with the Labor Department and obtain passbooks in order to take up employment. The unemployed were liable to be rounded up and sent away as forced labor to the Burma Siam Railway. Here is a Military Labor Corps armband, various forms of documentation, and badges. Water torture. They forced water down my throat until my belly bloated. Then they tied me to the ladder and let go. Two persons carried me and threw me into the air well. With their feet on my chest, they trampled hard on it. Water just gushed out. After I regained consciousness, I was sent back to my cell. On the following day, the whole process of torture was repeated. I lost a lot of weight due to the psychological effects. Very serious. It was not good to have water forced down. Your health would be affected. During the period when I was terribly tortured, I dreamt someone told me this. You must admit or else they, the Japanese, would beat you to death. 
I replied, I did nothing wrong. The answer came back as, even if you have not, you must still admit you're wrong. The next day, when I was taken out to be tortured again, I admitted, and for that, I did not receive the water treatment. Lim Singh, civilian POW, extracted from the Japanese occupation, 1942 to 1945. Here are prisoners of war in their camps. Japanese adopted different policies towards the ethnic groups. The Indians. Japanese policy was to harness Indian cooperation. In return, Japanese promised support for the in independence movement in India. The Indian National Army, INA, was formed to mobilize the Indians for action and gathered momentum under the charismatic leadership of Subban Chandra Boshi. Japanese propaganda helped to whip up intense Indian patriotism, patriotism during the Shonan years. Although the promise of Japanese support secured the cooperation of Indians in Singapore, some had doubts about Japanese sincerity. The treatment of other ethnic groups was quite different. The Chinese. The Japanese resented the Chinese because of their support for China during the Sino-Japanese War, 1937 to 1941. The fierce resistance by the local Chinese force during the Japanese advance into Malaya also deepened the dislikes of Japanese military against the Chinese. One of the reprisal acts of the Japanese military was the Operation Sukchin of the Chinese community. While the Chinese were brutally treated, the Japanese also recognized the need for Chinese cooperation to revive the chaotic economy. The Japanese initiated the formation of an overseas Chinese association with Dr. Lim Boon King as its president. The association was forced to raise $50 million gifts for the Japanese administration. Throughout the Shonen years, Japanese brutality and intimidation deepened the hatred of the Chinese community against the Japanese regime. The Malays. The Japanese were generally more friendly towards the Malays, and their lives and properties were not threatened. Japanese goodwill was also extended to the Malay royalty and Islamic matters left to the Malay religious elite. Malays were actively encouraged to emerge from their Kampong areas and participate in the modernization process and in the defense of Shonan and Malai. All Malays were taught useful skills so that they could become employed in factories, offices, and other jobs hitherto monopolized by non-Malays. Development during the Shonan years stirred the thinking of Malays and enhanced their communal feelings and gave them added self-confidence. The Eurasians. The Japanese were harsh in their treatment of Eurasians. This was because of their European descent. These suspected British sympathizers were interned for different periods in order to determine their loyalty and involvement with the Allied war efforts. Others were warned to regard the Japanese as their new rulers. A Eurasian association was formed, headed by J. Peglar, guided by the Japanese authorities. The objective was to promote Japanese culture and authority, and ensure that the Eurasian community cooperated with the Japanese government. The Eurasians were resettled in Bahau in Malaya, to eliminate possible resistance and alleviate the food shortage in Singapore. However, due to lack of adequate food and malarial conditions, many lost their lives. Here is a group picture of a Kempitai unit. The next display has something surprising and a bit upsetting. Canadian wheat is apparently being shown as part of the food supplies for Shona. 
learning the Japanese language and planting tapioca for food. Local people participated in Shonen first anniversary celebrations. The cinema was an agent of war propaganda and Japanese propaganda films were screened before the actual movies. Local children attended Japanese school. Rapid adjustments were made to the requirements of the Japanese regime, such as the learning of Nippongo, Japanese customs, and manners. Locals were often slapped if they did not bow properly or obey orders at sentry checkpoints. Eurasian settlers in Bahau in the Negri Sembilia cleared land for planting crops. Bahau, like Andau in Johor, was an agricultural settlement set up during the Shonan years to ease the, fo the food shortage problem in Shonan To. Chinese settlers in Endau in Johor had to clear the jungles and build their own roads and huts. Endau settlement developed rapidly and became known as Shonan Model Farm. The problem of shortages of food, daily essentials, and medicines led to black market activities. Although the Japanese authorities controlled food prices and took firm actions against offenders, the illicit trade was rampant. Street exhibitions and propaganda slogans to encourage the learning of the Japanese language and calling for unity and strengthening with Japan were put up as part of the Nipponization from, uh, campaign. Local people were encouraged to buy Japanese goods and to conduct business with Japan to attain self-sufficiency. The food control display and a crate of tapioca. A display of a man and child preparing to cook tapioca, the main food that people lived on during the Shonan period. And a Shonan To banner from the period with the dates 1942-1945 added to it. The next display boards are repeating what has been said in other displays. Here is a sign saying Singapore with the words Shonan To scribbled across it. Singapore was named Shonan To, Light of the South. 15th February 1942 marked the beginning of three and a half dark years in the lives of the people of Singapore. After 123 years of British rule, Lieutenant General Percival, commander of HQ Malaya Command, surrendered to Lieutenant General Yanashita, commander of the Japanese conquering force, Singapore. The impregnable forces of the British Empire in the East bowed to an Asian power. The Kempitai, or Japanese police force, was the most feared group in Singapore during this time. Its task was to crush all resistance to Japanese military rule, and it had the power to arrest civilians and military alike. Changes were experienced, experienced in all aspects of life during the occupation years. British Straits currency was replaced by Japanese banana currency. Japanese language, Nippongo, became the lingua franca of Singapore. Japanese propaganda movies were screened at cinemas. Local time was changed to Tokyo time, and the year and date followed the Japanese calendar. Singapore was renamed Shonen To, Light of the South. Here is the same thing in Chinese and Japanese. And outside again to the next displays. 1880s, the Tunnel A Complex. A unique and innovative defensive feature of Fort Siloso, the, electric, uh, the, electrically, the electricity fired underwater mines laid on the seabed at the western entrance to Singapore. Via remote control, these underwater mines would explode and damage any unidentified enemy vessel. They were controlled by a submarine mining post, which was housed 
this underground complex. The complex included two engine rooms, a boiler room, and a coal store. An oil store was added when oil replaced coal as an energy source, and the two engine rooms were converted into one large room suitable for oil-fired generators. In the 1930s, Fort Siloso was upgraded and a new gun battery was planned for the western end of the island. The complex was modified with more ammunition stores, an observation post, a gun emplacement, and a fire director tower at Siloso Point. Here is a picture of the exterior of the Tunnel A complex before restoration in 1994. Here is a 25 pounder gun on display. The Guns of Sentosa, 1939, 25 pounder howitzer gun, breech load, BL. The British developed the 25 pounder howitzer gun in the 1930s as a new artillery weapon combining functionalities of the gun and howitzer. It could operate as a field gun firing direct at visible targets, and as a howitzer by shooting over obstacles. It remained in British service until 1967, when it was regulated to training units. The howitzer gun proved to be one of the best field guns of its type, due to its rugged design, versatility, and reliability. Guns of this type are still used ceremonially in Singapore and the United Kingdom. 1939 is the year of origin of the gun. Here are gunners in Kangor, Johor, preparing the 25-pounder howitzer gun in the 1950s. Here's another look at the 25-pounder gun on display. The Fire Director Tower, 1880s. The ventilation shafts. Ventilation shafts are vertical air passages used in underground tunnels to allow air ventilation for the tunnels at Fort Siloso. Here is an older picture of the ventilation shafts above Tunnel A complex. The Fire Director Tower, 1942 to 1945. Garden of War times Staples. Imagine vegetables growing in school playgrounds and in football fields. This was a common sight during the Japanese occupation. Due to the food shortages, food prices skyrocketed and essential foodstuffs were rationed. People were encouraged to grow their own food crops and every available bit of land in public places was cultivated. Tapioca and sweet potatoes were quick to grow and became the staple substitutes for the scarce rice. Here are POWs sorting vegetables at Changi Prison in 1945, before the Japanese surrender. Further displays about wartime food. Grow your own food. The food shortage forced people to start exploring home agriculture as a way of feeding themselves, to develop self-sufficiency according to the Japanese administration. The campaign was also mandated in schools and public service. Every available land was turned into vegetable plots. Due to improper farming knowledge and soil fertility depletion, people turned to traditional fertilizers of using human excrement, leading to the spread of diseases. Sweet potato, tapioca, and rice. Substitutes for rice. As rice was deeply in short supply, root vegetables, tapiocas and sweet potatoes, were grown as substitutes for rice and became the staples. They survived well in various soil conditions and matured relatively quickly. They could be harvested, cooked, and eaten as soon as the roots formed. 
The plants also provided dense foliage to lend the appearance that people were industriously producing crops. Fire Director Tower, 1889, Fort Pasir Panjang. The mainland across the sea where Fort Pasir Panjang was built in 1889. The gun batteries there protected the western entrance to Singapore. By the 1930s, Fort Pasir Panjang consisted of three gun batteries fitted with two 15-pounder guns to six-inch guns and an 18-inch fixed-mounted gun. During the Battle for Singapore in 1942, the guns at Fort Pasir Panjang assisted the Malay Regiment in their 48-hour struggle against the Japanese invaders by turning around to fire at the advancing enemy troops along Pasir Panjang Road. Today, Fort Pasir Panjang is a public recreation park known as Labrador Park. Here is an old image of the view from Fort Siloso of the HMS Amethyst and Fort Pasir Panjang in the distance. The next signboards. Another signboard describing the Battle of Singapore in 1942. Diary of Disaster. 8 December 1941 to 31st January 1942. The Japanese 25th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Tomoyuki Yamashita, invades the Malayan Peninsula and rolls back the British, Australian, Indian, and Malay armies, commanded by Lieutenant General Arthur E. Percival, to the Straits of Johor. Singapore is bombed as reinforcements arrive and its defenses against invasion from the north are in disarray. On 31st January 1942, the last British and Australian troops crossed the causeway, which is then partially destroyed. 1st February 1942, Lieutenant General Yamashita finalizes his plans for the assault on Singapore. The 5th and 18th Divisions will land on the northwestern shoreline, while the Imperial Guards Division creates a diversion to the east. Japanese artillery will bombard the entire northern sector of Singapore to conceal the real assault area. On Singapore Island, Lieutenant General Percival assumes operation control of all troops, defenses are reinforced, and units hurriedly deployed. 2nd to 3rd February 1942. Japanese bombers destroy the oil storage tanks at the naval base at Sembawang and attack Singapore's railway station and nearby wharves as civilians try to board evacuation ships. Japanese intelligence units dispatch two teams of swimmers across the straits to gather information on the overextended Australian positions on the northern shoreline. 4th to 5th February 1942. Japanese aircraft and long-range guns bombard airfields and key installations. Japanese artillery in Johor shell Australian positions in the north and northwestern sections of the island. The last reinforcement convoy reaches Singapore under bomber attack, losing the Empress of Asia. 6 to 7 February 1942. As part of Lieutenant General Yamashita's diversionary tactics, Japanese artillery fire intensifies, particularly along the northeast front. Japanese Imperial Guards cross the Straits of Johor by boat and capture Pulau Ubin at the eastern end of the Straits. The attack on Singapore has begun. 8 February 1942. 440 Japanese guns bombard Singapore and the attack intensifies. The Australian Command HQ at Bukit Timau Road is bombed and telegraph and telephone communications are destroyed. The Japanese 5th and 18th Divisions cross the Straits of Johor and land in 
the northwest shore of the island. After furious fighting, the Australian 22nd Brigade is forced to withdraw, exposing the left flank of the 27th Brigade. 9th February 1942. Further Japanese troops land on the northwest shoreline. The Australian 22nd Brigade headquarters is withdrawn as the Japanese reach Amakeng village. Attempts are made to form a defense line between Tenga Airfield and Choa Chu Kang village. Reinforcements are rushed to the vital Kranji Jurong line. Incessant aerial and ground attack forces the Australian defenders of Tenga Airfield to withdraw to the Kranji Jurong line. 10th February 1942. The initial landing by the Imperial Guards between the Causeway and the Kranji River incurs heavy losses but gains a foothold. A misunderstanding leads to the withdrawal of the Australian 27th Brigade, who are then hotly pursued by further Japanese troops. Confusion leads to the abandonment of much of the Kranji Jurong line. Newly landed Japanese tanks destroy Indian defensive positions near Bukit Panjang village. 11 February 1942. Japanese troops reach Bukit Tima village. After a ferocious defense, the 15th Indian and Australian 22nd Brigades withdraw with heavy casualties. The Imperial Guards rush through the remnants of the Kranji Jurong Line towards the Pierce and McRitchie Reservoirs. The causeway is repaired and Japanese troops have unrestricted crossing of the Straits of Johor. British troops withdraw from the naval base area and retreat to Sembawang Airfield. 700 wounded Indian soldiers die in an air attack on the military hospital at Tyersall. 12th February 1942. Japanese forces approach the outskirts of the city, which is defended on four fronts. In the Pasir Panjang area, there is heavy fighting between the Japanese and troops of the 1st Malay Regiment and the Indian 44th Brigade. Lieutenant General Percival decides to withdraw all his forces behind the 28 mile, 45 kilometer long defense perimeter. Government House is hit by intense artillery and mortar fire. 13th February 1942. At his headquarters at the Ford factory on Bukit Tima Road, Lieutenant General Yamashita believes that the British are preparing for a long siege whilst waiting for reinforcements. He orders a final two-pronged assault on the city before the British defense line can consolidate. The Japanese 18th Division is already attacking along the island's south coast. The Imperial Guards are ordered to attack from the north and to take the Macritchie Reservoir. C Company, 1st Battalion, Malay Regiment, fights an epic 48-hour battle at Bashir Panjang Ridge and will be almost totally annihilated. Government House is abandoned, civilian casualties increase, and desertion and looting are rampant. 14 February 1942. The two-pronged Japanese attack intensifies. The Imperial Guards, supported by tanks, move out of the McRitchie Reservoir area to engage the British 53rd, 54th, and 55th Brigades. Japanese artillery and aircraft pound civilian targets. Water failure within the perimeter is highly probable because of bombing and the loss of reservoirs. 15th February 1942. The Imperial Guards break through in the north, and defending troops on the south coast are in retreat. Japanese troops meet reach Alexandra Barracks Hospital and massacre 200 doctors, staff, and wounded. With ammunition, food, fuel, and water near exhaustion, and with about 1 million soldiers and civilians within the perimeter, Lieutenant General Percival has no alternative but to capitulate. At 5.15 p.m. he arrives at the Ford factory at Bukit Tima 
and surrenders unconditionally to Lieutenant General Yavashta. Next location, the guns of Sentosa, the 12-pounder gun. 1893, the year of origin of the gun. 12-pounder QF gun, breech load, BL. Originally designed in 1893, the 12-pounder QF quick-firing gun was manufactured at the Ellswick Ordnance Company, Newcastle upon Tyne. Although the 12-pounder gun was obsolete before 1939, large numbers were brought out of storage in 1940. A 12-pounder gun, a replica of which is seen here, was mounted in this emplacement in 1941 to reinforce the defenses of Fort Siloso. During the battle for Singapore, this gun was ready for action, but no opening of fire was recorded. On 14 February 1942, the day before the British surrendered, the 12-pounder was thrown over the cliff to prevent it from falling into Japanese hands. Here is a picture of the last location of the 12-pounder QF gun at Sodosu Point in the 1970s. Here is a 12-pounder QF gun diagram, a range and rate of fire diagram. The HMS Sultan insignia. HMS Sultan refers to various ships and establishments, one of which was a 1940s shore base in Singapore. It was destroyed upon Singapore's surrender in 1942, but recommissioned in 1945 and operated until 1947. Next, the Fire Director Tower. 1930, the Fire Director Tower. This Fire Director Tower formed part of a Coast Artillery Command which directed guns of increased range and accuracy. Its height and location at Siloso Point commanded a clear view of the western approach to Singapore. The tower directed firing of the 12-pounder QF gun and the searchlights located on the shore below the gun emplacement. Here are three searchlight posts on stilts with the fire director tower above in the early 1990s. Another look at the 12-pounder QF gun and the fire director tower. A better look at the mannequin in the tower and the entrance to the gunner's room. Inside the Gunner's Room, Watch Shelter, 1942. This is a recreation of a watch shelter, abandoned by soldiers when news of the impending surrender reached Blackang Mati. The room was used by soldiers who were on active duty in the tunnel complex. A better look at the stuff in the room, including an aircraft recognition chart. Another sign at the Fire Director Tower. 1930s Siloso Point. The old Malay name for Siloso Point at the western end of the island was Sarang Ramau or Tiger's Lair. In the 1930s the tunnel complex which housed the submarine mining post and engine room was extended with the construction of a gun emplacement and a fire director tower at Siloso Point. More rooms for ammunition stores and duty watch were added to the complex. Whilst this gun emplacement at Siloso Point was designed for a twin six-pounder gun, 
only an old 12-pounder was available when war came to Singapore in 1942. Here is a picture of Siloso Point with the remains of a gun emplacement for a twin 6-pounder in the 1970s. Observation Post This observation post commanded a clear view of the western entrance to Keppel Harbor, which was the original naval harbor on Singapore Island. It overlooked the southwestern limit of the final defensive perimeter around the city during the Battle for Singapore in February 1942. A further display that includes the recording of the final moments of the fortress just before the surrender on February 15, 1942. Archaeologist at Work As part of our study and development of Fort Siloso as a heritage site, Santosa is presently engaged in an archaeological project conducted by a team of archaeologists from the National University of Singapore. Archaeological surveys and excavations contribute to the understanding of the practices of the colonial past, the military significance and defense concerns of the colonial government of that period and the unveiling of another dimension of the local heritage of Sentosa Island. The artifacts stored in this room are excavated from the grounds in Sentosa and the archaeology team is presently processing and studying them. Some interesting artifacts recovered included colonial coins, Chinese and European ceramics, 19th century building materials, parts of artillery shells, glass bottles, cigarette tins, buttons, and other uniform paraphernalia. Here is fuel storage for the electrical generator. And out we go on the way to the surrender chambers. The guns of Sentosa. 1867, 64-pounder RML gun, rifle. Muzzle load, RML. Manufactured in 1867, two Mark III guns were emplaced at Fort Siloso as part of the fort's initial armament in the 1880s. They were positioned so as to protect the western approach to Keppel Harbor. They were made of wrought iron with a steel tube which was rifled with three grooves. Rifling imparted a spin on the projectile. This stabilized the flight of the projectile, resulting in greater accuracy. They became obsolete for coast artillery use in 1902, whereupon most of them were scrapped and disposed of. The five guns on, on display at Fort Siloso were moved from Pearls Hill Police Headquarters and mounted here in 1974. 1867 is the year of manufacture for the gun. Here is a range chart for the gun. Here is a 64-pounder gun barrel diagram. And here is a 64-pounder gun found in Santosa in the 1990s. The next display are the guns of Santosa. 19th century, 13-inch trench mortars 
muzzle load. The 13 inch motor dates back to the early 1800s. It was designed to, to fire high, to fire explosive projectiles at steep angles, sending the projectiles on a high trajectory over the enemy's ramparts. It was effectively used in World War I trench warfare for firing into the enemy's trench. They were gradually replaced by new, lighter, and more mobile weapons. No mortars were put into service at Fort Siloso. These mortars were originally displayed at the Victoria Memorial Hall in Singapore and were later moved to the National Museum. They were donated to Fort Siloso in 1969 and mounted here in 1974. The 19th century was the period of manufacture of the gun. Here is the range chart. And here are the mortars themselves. And here is a better look at the gun displays. Now we leave the gun displays and go into the World War II Surrender Chambers display. 8 February 1942. The timeline begins for the Battle of Singapore. From Ian Morrison, Times correspondent, Singapore, wrote, Tens of thousands of men of many races fought and bled and died. The British surrender. The actual room is at the Ford Motor Factory, so this is a replica. Historical reenactment. The British surrender Singapore. The victor and the vanquished. Historical commentators concur that though Percival tried his best, he was a general that had been promoted out of his depth. In contrast, General Yamashita was nicknamed the Tiger of Malaya and achieved a certain level of fame among both Japanese and non-Japanese alike, with reports of him being a strong, imposing, and highly intel intelligent general. The British Surrender This diorama captured the historic moment on 15 February 1942, when the British officially surrendered to the Japanese in the Ford Motor Factory boardroom located at Bukit Timah in central Singapore. The seats displayed here are the original seats that were used during the surrender ceremony. The British delegation included 1. Lieutenant General A. E. Percival, General Officer Commanding Malaya. 2. Brigadier K. S. Torrance, General Staff. 3. Brigadier T. K. Newbingen, Deputy, Deputy Adjutant General. 4. Major Cyril Wilde, Interpreter, GSO 3 of 3rd Corps. For the Japanese delegation, 1. Lieutenant General Tomoyuki Yamashita, Commander in Chief, Japanese Forces Malaya. 2. Major General Sosaku Suzuki, Chief of Staff. 3. Major General Keishin Yamaki, Executive Chief of Staff. 4. Lieutenant Colonel Ichi Sugita, Staff Officer, Chief of Information. 5. Colonel Hanshiro Ikitani, Head of Operations, Staff Officer, Chief of First Section. 6. Lieutenant Colonel Marayuki Okamura, Staff Officer, Imperial General Headquarters. 
7. Commander Taro Nagai, Staff Officer, Navy. 8. Colonel Hubenosuke Yamatsu, Staff Officer, Chief of Second Section. 9. Major Iwachi Fujibara, Staff Officer, Southern Army Headquarters. 10. Major Takashi Kagoshima, Staff Officer, Southern Army Headquarters. 11. Major Tada Kihiko Hayashi, Staff Officer. Now for the two leaders. Lieutenant General Tomoyuki Yamashita devises a plan that relies on speed and surprise with only three divisions of the Imperial Japanese Army, initiates a land attack from Malaya and orders troops to fight at night in the monsoon. At the same time, Lieutenant General Percival does not develop a succinct strategy, concentrates on defending Singapore from a sea assault bombs Yamashita's launches as he attempts to put as he attempts to put troops ashore. Back to Yamashita. Keeps momentum by moving soldiers with the use of bicycles with tanks clearing the way. For Percival, he relies on lines of barbed wire and infantry to defend, with no tanks, air support, and dwindling morale, they withdraw. Back to Yamashita. Orders troops to enter Singapore via the northwestern coastline. Orders troops to attack and capture key locations that held British resources. And for Percival, places strongest forces at the naval base located east of the causeway. Attempts to defend the island's entire coastline and spreads his forces too thinly. The journey to the Ford Motor Company. On 15 February 1942, once the decision to surrender had been made at 9.30 a.m., a British delegation left Fort Canning for the enemy lines at Bukit Tima Road. They were met by Colonel Sigita, who refused their invitation to the city for negotiations. Instead, the British were to fly a Japanese flag from the top of the Cathay building to signify that General Percival would surrender personally to General Yamashita. The flag was raised. At 5.15 p.m., the British surrender party drove to the Bukit Tima Ford Motor Factory. By 6.10 p.m., the two generals had signed the surrender document. At present, there are no official records of the surrender. Here is Lieutenant General Arthur E. Percival on the right, and the other British officers on the way to the Ford Motor Factory at Bukit Tima to surrender to the Japanese. An interactive map showing the Japanese invasion of 1941 to 1942, followed by the Allied counteroffensive of Hope on the Horizon 1945 Between November 1944 and March 1945, Allied raids on Singapore, targeting the naval base and dockyard facilities, gave Singaporeans hope after three years of hell. Following VE Day on 8 May 1945, the recapture of Malaya, codenamed Operation Zipper, was negated by the dropping of the atomic bombs in August 1945 and the subsequent Japanese surrender. 
the reoccupation of Singapore, codenamed Operation Tide Race, began as the British quickly made the Japanese sign an agreement to terms of surrender on 4th September 1945 on board the HMS Sussex in Keppel Harbour before the official surrender ceremony was held on 12th September 1945 at City Hall. The British were tasked with disarming and removing Japanese troops and at the same time liberating and relieving Allied POWs. At first, little changed in Singapore. Some armed Japanese troops were allowed to remain in the town to maintain law and order until the arrival of British forces. The beginning of the end. The Allied island hopping strategy was successful and the Japanese were forced out of most of the Pacific Islands. Although the fighting was fierce and with many casualties on both sides, as they moved closer to Japan, the Allied forces were able to use the islands as bases to conduct many air raids on Japan. The capture of Iwo Jima was especially useful in this cause. On the nights of March 9th to 10th, 1945, more than 300 US B-29 bombers launched an air raid on Tokyo which killed 100,000 people, mainly civilians, and the resulting firestorm burned 40 square kilometers of Tokyo to the ground. Following the end of the war in Europe, Allied leaders from the US and Britain met from July 17th to August 2nd, 1945 in Potsdam, Germany to determine the fate of Germany. On 29th July, they issued the Potsdam Declaration in which they demanded Japan's unconditional surrender and immediate retreat from occupied territories in the Pacific. The declaration contained the warning that the alternative for Japan was prompt and utter destruction, alluding to the atomic bombs. Japan refused. Even after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, the Japanese did not declare their surrender. Finally, after the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's surrender on August 15, 1945. The Japanese officially surrendered to General Douglas MacArthur on board an American battleship, USS Missouri, at Tokyo Bay on September 2, 1945, ending World War II. The B-29 Super Fortress Bomber, the aircraft model used to carry and drop the atomic bombs. Hiroshima Destruction On 6th August 1945, approximately 80,000 people were killed in less than a minute. The atom bomb named Fat Man before being dropped on Nagasaki. The second atomic bomb detonated over Nagasaki, Japan on August 9, 1945. Singapore celebrates Japanese surrender. This document is a replica of Emperor Hirohito's formal message to the Japanese people announcing the surrender of Japan's troops to the Allied forces. This document was presented by Mr. Kenkichi Nakagawa, Mayor of Urawa City, November 1980. The Surrender Chamber, with the Japanese surrendering to the Allies at the end of World War II. Return of Allied Forces, City Hall, 12th September, 1945. The Japanese delegation, led by General Seishiro Itagagi, formally surrendering to Lord Louis Mountbatten. Allied Representatives, Major General William Ronald Campbell Penny, Director of Intelligence, Southeast Asia Command, Great Britain. Britain may have emerged victorious in World War II and had recovered the territory lost during the war, but its prestige and authority, not to mention its wealth, had been severely reduced, leading to the eventual collapse of its empire. Brigadier K. S. Demaya, India. India went on to struggle for its independence from the British 
and accepted the partition of the country, narrowly avoiding a descent into chaos and communal war before power could be transferred from British to Indian hands. General P. Leclerc, France. France faced the monumental task of rebuilding the country after the devastation of World War II. It would also be involved in prolonged conflicts culminating in independence for most of its colonies in Africa and Southeast Asia. France would go on to lead a European-wide process of integration. Admiral Sir Arthur John Power, Commander-in-Chief, East Indies Fleet, Great Britain. Lieutenant General Raymond Albert Wheeler, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia, USA. The post-World War II period would see the rise of the United States as a global superpower. However, a new form of international tension, the Cold War, would emerge between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies. Lieutenant General Wheeler, General Leclerc, Admiral Power, Brigadier Thimaya. A continuation of the return of the Allied forces, City Hall, September 12, 1945. Admiral Lord Louis Francis Albert Victor Nicholas Mountbatten. Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia, Great Britain. Here is Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten leading three cheers for the King during the victory parade in Singapore after the signing of the formal surrender of Japan. General Sir William Joseph Slim, Commander-in-Chief, Allied Air Forces, Southeast Asia Command, Great Britain. Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, Commander-in-Chief, Allied Air Forces, Southeast Asia Command, New Zealand. New Zealand went on to experience post-war growth. The war also brought the indigenous Maori and New Zealanders of European descent together, overseas and at home. New Zealand would also take an active part in the 1945 conference that set up the United Nations. Major General Feng Yi, head of the Chinese military mission to Southeast Asia Command, China. Shortly after the end of World War II, civil war broke out between the nationalists and communists. The communists were victorious, and on 1st October 1949, the leader of the communists, Mao Zedong, proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China, the PRC. Admiral Lord Mountbatten. Continuation of the return of Allied forces City Hall, September 12, 1945. Air Vice Marshal A.T. Cole, Australia. After World War II, the Australian government committed to increasing the population in order to meet labor shortages, protect Australia from external threat, and create prosperity. Under the guidance of the Department of Post-War Reconstruction, the country was set on a sustained path of economic growth. Colonel D. C. Borman van Vredel, the Netherlands. The Dutch government returned to a war-torn Netherlands from its exile in London, and with the help of the Marshall Plan, quickly worked to stimulate growth. The bitter experience of invasion and occupation led the Netherlands to become a leading supporter of international cooperation. General Slim, Air Chief Marshal Park, Major General Yi, Colonel Van Breedem. The Japanese as POWs. Once the reoccupation of Singapore was established, Japanese troops were put to work. Their tasks included clearing rubble, filling in trenches, 
laboring to improve the airfield at Changi, providing nursing staff, and assisting the clearance of civilian internee camps. Immediately after the surrender, Yamashita, as commander of all Japanese forces in the Philippines, was arrested as a war criminal, charged with responsibility for the atrocities committed by Japanese forces under his command against civilians in Manila. He was sentenced to death and was hanged in Manila on 23rd February 1946. Here are Japanese soldiers put to work as Allied soldiers watch. Here is further information on the end of the Japanese Empire, City Hall, September 12, 1945. This is General Yamashita, former commander of all Japanese forces in the Philippines, at his war crimes trial in Manila, sometime in late 1945. Here are Japanese POWs put to work as Allied soldiers watch. Post-war Japan. In the aftermath of World War II, much of Japan's infrastructure was in shambles. Japanese soldiers returned to find rampant starvation, unemployment, and inflation. The Allied occupation forces led by the U.S. concentrated on demilitarization conducting war crimes trials, rebuilding the nation, and fostering democratic institutions. The Japanese demonstrated their resilience and discipline as they worked to rebuild their country, which would eventually become a world power. Here are Japanese POWs surrendering their swords to Allied forces. Trials of Japanese war criminals took place in Singapore, Tokyo, and Yokohama. Japanese representatives at the surrender September 12, 1945 at Singapore City Hall. General Seishiro Itagaki, 7th Area Army, born 1885, died 1948. Charged with war crimes. Tried at the International Military Tribunal in Tokyo, found guilty and sentenced to death. Lieutenant General Akita Nakamura, 18th Area Army, 1889-1966. Retired from the Army in 1946, not charged with any war crimes. Lieutenant General Hayashi Kinoshita, 3rd Air Army, 1886-1969. Retired from the Air Army in 1947, not charged with any war crimes. Vice Admiral Shibata Yaichiro, 2nd Southern Expeditionary Fleet, 1890-1981, charged with war crimes and tried at Manau, at Manus, in 1951, found not guilty. Vice Admiral Shigeru Fukudome, 1st Southern Expeditionary Fleet, 1891-1973, Arrested for war crimes and tried in Singapore. Found guilty of negligence of duties and imprisoned. He was released in 1950. Lieutenant General Heitaro Kyotaro Kimura, Burma Area, Burma Area Army, 1888-1948. Charged with war crimes. Tried at the International Military Tribunal in Tokyo found guilty and sentenced to death. Lieutenant General Takazo Namuta, Numata, Chief of Staff to Field Marshal Count H. Taiochi, Commander-in-Chief, Southern Army, 1892 to 1961. In May 1948, he was sentenced to seven years in prison by the International Military Tribunal for War Crimes. Vice Admiral Tukudome, Vice Admiral Shibata, Lieutenant General Kinoshita, General Itogaki, Lieutenant General Kimura, Lieutenant General Nakamura, Lieutenant General Numata.
in pursuit of peace. Post-World War II conflicts across Asia. We cannot take our peace and stability for granted. Prime Minister Li Xian Lun. The aftermath in Asia. After the Japanese surrender in 1945, countries in war-torn Asia underwent diverse conflicts and decolonization. Places where some countries were granted their independence from their colonial masters, some had to fight for it. A few newly independent countries acquired stable governments almost immediately. Others were ruled by dictators and military juntas for decades or endured civil wars. National and regional challenges and conflicts emerge, which either had a direct or indirect influence on Singapore's journey towards becoming a successful and peaceful city-state. Next are sliding boards covering brief histories of several conflicts. Confrontasi, 1963 to 1966. This was a civil war in Indonesia in opposition to the formation of Malaysia. It had many international forces involved in fighting the rebels. The Korean War, 1950 to 1953, which was another international conflict. Independence of Ceylon, 1948. This country became Sri Lanka. Indonesian National Revolution, 1945 to 1949. The Anti-National Service Riots, 1954. The Hok Lee Bus Strike and Riot, 1955. The Malayan Emergency, 1948 to 1960. Indian Independence, 1947. And the Partition of India in 1947, and the war in Vietnam between the French and Vietnamese communists, 1945 to 1954. Lest we forget. These poppies are reminders of those we lost to the horrors of conflict and the preciousness of the peace they fought hard to achieve. The significance of the poppy as a lasting memorial symbol to the fallen was realized by the Canadian surgeon and brigade commander John McRae in his poem in Flanders Fields, published in 1915. The poppy came to represent the immeasurable sacrifice made by his comrades and quickly became a lasting memorial to those who died in World War I and later conflicts. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard among the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in flanders fields take up our quarrel with the foe to you from failing hands we throw the torch be yours to hold it high if ye break faith with us who die we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. By John McRae, soldier, physician, and poet. Here's a better look at the poppy and memorial room. The staircase on the way out of the surrender chambers, with wartime propaganda posters decorating the wall. The next display, the seven-inch gun. 1885, 7-inch RML gun, rifle, muzzle low, RML. The 7-inch RML gun was designed by the Royal Gun Factory and was manufactured by the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich. It formed part of the initial armament of Fort Siloso in the 1880s and 1890s. Whilst the gun might have been what was needed when it was first uh, entered service, it was not considered to be fit for its purpose in later years, due to its poor penetration of armor and other shortcomings. It was excavated during the construction of Sentosa's golf course in 1969 
and mounted here in 1974. 1885 is the year of origin of the gun. Its rate of fire was unknown and its range was a little over 5,000 meters. 7 inch RML gun projectile diagram and a sketch of the gun and a look at the actual gun. The next gun display, 1923, 140 millimeter coast defense guns, breech load. Designed in 1914 as coastal defense artillery and manufactured in the Kure arsenal in 1923. These Japanese guns were found in Singapore's Mandai jungle by officer cadets of the Singapore Armed Forces Training Institute in 1966. They are presumed to have been installed by the Japanese during their occupation of Singapore, 1942 to 1945. Japanese artillery was noted for its comparably long range and lightness of the pieces. However, the demand for far outstripped production due to the country's relatively weak industrial base. The gun was mounted on a single pedestal, single casemated, or a twin turret. 1923 was the year of origin of the gun. The ammunition type was shells. Gun crew was unknown. Optimal elevation was 35 degrees. Artillery range was 20,574 meters or 67,500 feet. Rate of fire was 18 rounds a minute. Wrong. 10 rounds per minute and here is the artillery range chart. A sketch of the gun and the actual guns on display. World War II Japanese Special Naval Landing Forces insignia. These forces consisted of, of numbered 12 battalion sized Japanese Imperial Navy units. They spearheaded Japan's assault landing operations during World War II. There is an icon here on the sign that shows the badge when scanned. The next display, another 64 pounder RML gun, but this display is a bit different. This gun is in its mount. Here is the same information as was displayed with a previous gun. But here is the actual gun in its proper mounting. Next, the guard room. 1900s, the guard room. The guard room was where soldiers who were tasked with guard duties stayed during their period of duty. The guard usually consisted of a guard commander and a certain number of men. During guard duties, some men were sent out on patrol while others manned the gates. In the 1940s, the guard room housed some Japanese POWs. From 1989 to 1992, this guard room was used to house Chia Dai Po, who was detained under the Singapore International Security Act in 1987 for alleged involvement with the Communist Party of Malaya, CPM. He spent three years of his detention living in the guardroom before he was allowed to live in mainland Singapore. The guardroom in 1970. Japanese POWs were housed on the island after the war, such as Chief Sagawa, senior Japanese NCO. He stayed in the guardroom after the Japanese surrender in 1945 until he was repatriated. Guard Room, 1885. This is a recreation of a typical guard room used by the guard responsible for the security of the fort. Sergeant Major Cooper, standing, is seen here reporting to Lieutenant Rice, officer in charge of Fort Siloso, on the arrival of new, recru new recruits from England. The next display, Parbakan. 
1885, power buckling. Power buckling was used to move and hoist heavy equipment. It was a very labor intensive task. When Fort Siloso was first constructed, it was the only method available to move and raise heavy equipment up the slopes. It involved the use of sledges with wooden rollers, planks, ropes, and blocks and tackle, which are seen here. The tripod at the top of the hill was known as a gin. It incorporated a windlass, which was used to haul the load up the slope and, when moved to the gun emplacement, to lift it to its final position. Although soldiers of the Royal Navy and Royal Engineers provided the manpower for this operation, they were often assisted by the local war force. Shears and Derrick. Shears are a two-legged lifting device for heavy lifting. A derrick is a type of crane with a movable pivoted arm for moving weights. They are both still used today. The next display is another Japanese gun. 1944 120mm dual purpose guns breech load BL. Designed in the 1920s to engage both naval targets and air targets, these Japanese guns equipped both ships and coastal defense batteries. They were manufactured by the Kure Arsenal in 1944, when production of these guns surged due to the demands of the war. The guns displayed here were discovered in the, in the forest reserve to the east of the Pierce Reservoir in 1979. It is thought that the guns were an element of the overall Japanese defense plans for the expected invasion of Singapore, Operation Zipper, planned by the British for 1945. They were mounted at Fort Siloso in 1981. 1944 is the year of origin of the gun. Ammunition type was shells, gun crew was unknown, Optimal elevation was 33 degrees. Artillery range was 16,000 meters, 52,493 feet. Rate of fire was 11 rounds per minute. And here is the artillery range chart. This is the actual gun. The next display is titled The Life of a Gunner. Here are Royal Artillery Gunners Joseph Cussell and friend around 1941. 1880s to 1940s, life of a gunner. For the soldiers at Fort Siloso, fighting was an exceptional circumstance rather than the norm. For many, life consisted of fighting off boredom from the daily routine of exercises, drills and inspections. Favorite pastimes included board games, gambling, and drinking. Card gambling games were strictly forbidden, but could never be stopped. The divisions, brigades, and regiments that the soldiers were organized into gave them something more concrete to identify with than just queen and country, and in many cases became his home and family, generating fierce loyalty. Here is a soldier resting in the barrack room, sometime between 1945 and 1956. Here is gunner A. Butt, 11th Battery, Royal Artillery, sometime between 1918 and 1939. Further displays about the life of a gunner. 1880s to 1940s. A long way from home. Food was a simple fare, except for officers who could have enjoyed something more appetizing. Curry would have been on the menu, especially for those who had served in India. Health care was poor during the 19th century, and soldiers were prone to a variety of tropical diseases and disorders, such as malaria, beriberi, and tuberculosis. In 1881, pay for a gunner was one shilling and two pence per day. 
In today's terms, this is approximately eight Singapore dollars. It was possible to earn extra pay for earning good conduct badges, taking on extra duties, and promotion. To get to Singapore in the late 1880s involved a long, tedious sea journey of many weeks. The length of the voyage could be extended greatly if the ship met unfavorable winds or storms. Being away from their families for long periods of time also meant that homesickness was inevitable. Here is roughly the same information in Chinese. Here is a letter from a soldier to his family in 1885. Here it is, more enlarged. A high proportion of British soldiers were literate and communication from home made a vital contribution to the maintenance of morale. Letters from friends and family kept soldiers in touch with the life that they had left behind and was also therapeutic for the soldiers. Number 2506, Corporal J. Arnold, 6th Battery, Royal Artillery, Blackang Mati, Singapore, 17th December, 1885. Dear Ma, I bet you are pleased to hear from your soldier's son. Did you get the letters I sent you from Aden and Bombay? It was terribly hot to cross the Indian Ocean. It was calm most of the time when it was, we saw, flying fishes. Would you believe it? I was not seasick, but when we ran into a storm one night, I was. It was not good below deck with the boat rolling and tossing us about and, all us, and us all packed together like sardines. Well, Ma, we got to Singapore at least after 10 weeks at sea, and I was pleased to get off that boat. I hadn't been off two minutes before I was on another little one that took us to an island called Blackang Mati. We got off at the pier and marched about a mile. Then we got to the barracks. I saw Bert. You know that bloke who lives down the street? He, w he said he was browned off. I'll say he was. I looked as white as a lily beside him. As I said, the island I am on is Blackang Mati. It is a Malay name. Some say it means the island of death. Others say the island beyond the dead. It is four degrees from the equator, as so Battery Sergeant Major Cooper says. He's a hard bloke, but fair. Fort Siloso, where I am, is at the western end of the island. I am up at six every morning, and after inspection of the barrack room, we have our breakfast. The food's almost like home, Ma, and it's cooked by one of the locals, too. I do the same job almost every day. Parade after breakfast, then it's off to the seven-inch gun. We have to help with the moving of the new guns. Just our luck. The locals called coolies help out, too. Strange name for them, since the one thing this place isn't is cool. We stop work at noon when it gets too hot to do anything. We have our dinner, then it's off for the day, and I go swimming at the Paga. That's the pool the sappers have made in the sea. Me and Bert saw a shark looking in on us the other day, but there are wooden stakes to keep them out. There are other creatures here too, Ma, like snakes and wild monkeys and all sorts of strange insects and mosquitoes that drive us mad. It's a lot different to Woolwich, but the blokes in my barrack room are a good crowd and I am getting used to the life here. Well, Ma, the mail leaves in half an hour, so I can't write anymore. I will write next week and tell you about Singapore Town, which I haven't seen much of yet. Your loving son, Joey. More guns of Sentosa. Malayan cannons. It is believed that gun making was introduced to this region by Muslim traders from the Middle East in the 15th century. The design of Malay cannons differed from their European counterparts. Instead of wheels, they utilized swivel mounts. 
Malay cannons were generally of quite small caliber and were highly decorated with scroll, floral, and other designs. Generally, the muzzle was flared and sometimes designed as a dragon's mouth, which was possibly a Chinese influence. They were used as weapons of war and also to single, signal the start and end of the daily fast during the Ramadan period. The firing of cannons was also used by royalty to announce a royal birth or wedding. Here is a sketch of Malay cannons. Here about the Malayan cannon motif. Malayan cannons of all sizes were often highly decorated with scroll work, elaborate Islamic inspired floral and geometric motifs, fans and rings. This is an example of a motif that would have been used, once again requiring your smartphone to scan the image. Here is the selection of nine Malay cannons on display. Next location, the barracks and officers mess display. A closer look at the signs, barrack room and officers mess. First, the barrack room. 1935, barrack room. Soldiers were housed in barrack rooms in this building. The standard features for a barrack room were the iron bedstead, a shelf unit, and a kit box for each soldier. In tropical stations, mosquito nets were essential. Here is a picture of the officer's barracks sleeping quarters. 1935, Officer's Mess. Built in 1935, this building formerly housed a number of officers of the unit stationed at Fort Siloso. Amenities in an officer's mess included sleeping quarters, dining and sitting rooms, a kitchen, and toilet facilities. The picture is part of the officer's mess that included an ante room where the officers would socialize. Barrack Room, 1885. Experience the smell of the barrack room, section of which you see here. This is where the men rested when they were off duty. A soldier's bunk space consisted of a metal bed, shelf unit, and mosquito net. Laundry, 1885. The soldiers would often take care of their own laundry or, for a small fee, send it to the Dobi Walla or laundry man. He was usually a local employed by the army. The laundry was done using very simple tools like a water boiler, sink, manual mangle, wooden buckets, scrubbing boards, and very strong arms. For a little extra, the Dobi Walla would also do the ironing. And here is the kitchen with Sergeant Major Coopy, Sergeant Major Cooper, taking a close look at the food being cooked.
1885, the tailor's shop. For a small sum of money, the resident tailor would mend items of uniform and personal clothing. Like the cook and the dobiwala, the tailor was usually locally recruited. The tailor would also attach insignia to uniforms and could be employed to make new items of clothing for his customers. This building, built in 1935, was originally the sergeant's mess. And here we are finally at the last display of a few 7-inch RML guns. 1885 7-inch RML gun, rifle, muzzle load, RML. The 7-inch RML was designed by the Royal Gun Factory and was manufactured by the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich. This gun was sometimes referred to as a bottle gun because its shape resembled soda water bottles of that period. It formed part of the initial armament of Fort Siloso in the 1880s and 1890s. It was excavated during the construction of Sentosa's golf course in 1969 and mounted here in 1974. Again, 1885 was the year of origin of the gun. Here is a drawing of a BL gun on an Armstrong hydro pneumatic disappearing carriage. Here is a diagram of wrought iron rifled muzzle loading 7 inch guns of the time. Ammunition type was shells, gun crew was 10, the optimal elevation was 12 to 29 degrees. Artillery range was 5,029 meters or 16,500 feet. The rate of fire was unknown and here is the range chart. And the 7 inch bottle gun barrels displayed in a light hearted way. Here is the mounting of an 8 inch BL gun at Siloso Point for display in 1974. Here we have the hoisting up of a 9.2 inch into display, 19.2 inch gun into display emplacement at Fort Siloso in 1974. 1885 gun drill. It's iron gun! yards on present bearing, which shall flow. Last Fort Standing. Today, the protection of Singapore no longer relies on forts. Over the years, the country has invested in modern military equipment and well-trained personnel. The Republic of Singapore Navy, RSN, protects Singapore's maritime borders. It also carries out coordinated patrolling and information sharing with the navies of neighboring countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, to keep the Straits of Malacca and Singapore safe for the numerous vessels that ply through every year. Fort Siloso is the last preserved fort in Singapore. Its buildings, guns and trails beckon explorers to find out more about its dramatic past. And here we are back to the beginning of the park and the sign says the preamble before the excursions. Here is the sea traffic in the Straits today as we leave 
for Siloso.